Awesome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Archaeobiking. Today is Juneteenth, the holiday that commemorates the emancipation of African Americans from the brutal institution of chattel slavery in the United States. In honor of this holiday, today I'm going to be doing three videos about the struggles and attempts to achieve emancipation from chattel slavery by African Americans throughout the history of this brutal institution. The first of these videos is going to be about the largest rebellion started by enslaved Africans in uh, what is now uh, the United States and North America, the Stono Rebellion. So throughout the history of the institution of chattel slavery, there have been quite a few rebellions started by enslaved Africans with the goal of achieving emancipation from this brutal institution, with, of course, some being success more successful than others. Uh, some I have already covered on this channel. Uh, there's the Haitian Revolution, one of the largest and the one of the most successful, if not the most successful, uh, rebellions started by enslaved Africans, which resulted in the creation of the Haitian Republic. Uh, or another video, another rebellion I covered on this channel, the 1733 slave revolt of the Danish West Indies, uh, modern day the modern day Virgin Islands, uh, that ended in disaster for the African Americans attempting to gain slavery, both of which I will link in the I card of this video. However, uh, for today's video, we're going to shift away from the Caribbean uh, and we're going to take a look at North America, specifically the British colony of South Carolina, uh, a colonial entity that was in existence from 1608 to 1782 CE. However, it's important to note that before the uh, before uh, the system of African American or of African chattel slavery was instituted, there was an earlier uh, system of slavery used involving Native Americans, uh, and this involved the capture of uh, either through trade or warfare uh, of Native American individuals who are put in, often either put into hard labor in the colonies like South Carolina themselves or were taken and sold off to work in hard labor and plantations in the Caribbean, uh, British Caribbean colonies such as Jamaica. And this system stayed in place for quite a while uh, with even some Native Americans, uh, such as Tomachichi of the Yamacraw Creek tribe, becoming very wealthy and gaining some certain amount of influence from this institution of uh, Native American slavery. Uh, and it wasn't just him, there were also some tribes, such as the Yamasee and the Tuscarora, who profited a great deal from selling some of their political enemies off in this institution. However, this institution would soon begin to chafe even those uh, Native Americans who benefited from it, uh, such as the Tuscarora, who started uh, the Tuscarora War in 1711 and almost defeated the British until the final defeat of the Tuscarora in 1715, with the main cause of this war being the increase of Native American slavery and the damages that it put uh, and strains that it put on the Tuscarora community, uh, as well as the Yamasee War, which happened uh, basically immediately after the Tuscarora War uh, for essentially the same issues. After the Tuscarora were defeated, the Yamasee began to also become chafed under the brutal institution of Native American slavery, so they too started a war against South Carolina, only to be eventually defeated in 1717 CE. And I already did a video on this that will be linked into the i-card. 
So, as a result of these two large-scale wars against Native Americans over the institution of Native American slavery, Native American slavery would begin to be phased out of the general culture of colonial England, and it would begin to be replaced by the transatlantic slave trade. So the transatlantic slave trade, or the triangular trade, involved the shipping of enslaved Africans, mainly from West Africa, into the British colonies, uh, either in the 13 colonies here or in British colonies in the Caribbean, such as Jamaica, where they would be put into hard labor and forced to harvest raw materials that would be sent back to Europe. And here's a depiction of that sort of institution here. Uh, in fact, the transatlantic slave trade would eventually uh, far, <laughs> far uh, beyond anyone could imagine outpace uh, and eclipse the number of enslaved individuals that Native American slavery produced, uh, with Britain alone embarking almost three million enslaved Africans into their colonies, and then by proxy, uh, the U.S., a, another British colony um, that gained its independence, obviously, at this point, uh, itself would embark around 300,000. Um, and this, of course, was not all at once. This was in between 1792, uh, when the trans when the triangular transatlantic slave trade was started with Native American slavery by Christopher Columbus, but it would continue well after this with African slavery as well. Uh, and here's a sort of little graph to get the idea of how many, just how many. Uh, enslaved Africans were shipped into the British colonies and colonies of other European empires as well. And all of this would uh, would lead to the eventual background factors that themselves led to the Stone Rebellion. Uh, the most prominent of which being the, cre you know, the creation of plantation culture in early colonial South Carolina, which had, to be fair, already been sort of on a trend of creation, sort of had been already building up uh, during the uh, final years of Native American slavery, but it really became a culture and institution of the colonial uh, Southern North America during the rise and prominence of African chattel slavery, which of course was a very brutal institution that involved uh, harsh punishments for even minor infractions, such as um, lashings and whippings, where an individual would be tied to a post and whipped for hours uh, until the plantation owner or the uh, uh, or the enforcer, the overseer, would feel that the enslaved African had learned his lesson. It would involve the forced separation of children of African and uh, eventually African-American children from their parents to be sold into slavery themselves. Uh, and then here is an example of the lashings, uh, and it would also involve other brutal uh, uh, customs and methods, such as literally branding enslaved Africans uh, and enslaved African Americans like they were cattle. Uh, there's a reason it's called chattel slavery. They were viewed as objects rather than people. And the main commodity, the main crop that this institution was built upon during the early colonial period of South Carolina, uh, and really the early colonial period of other colonies like um, South, like North Carolina and Virginia, was that of rice, with the value of land uh, per acre being based off of things like uh, 
the the price of rice or the yeah the relative price of rice to land value like the index value you see here uh, and this is a graph that shows that value the land value relative to the, to the price of rice throughout the period from 1720 to uh, 1775 uh, but of course our focus for this video is uh, from 1720 to 1739. So you can see during that period and even onwards, rice was a very important commodity in the early South Carolina plantation culture, uh, which of course played a major part in the triangular trade where uh, things like rice alongside other commodities such as lumber and furs and tobacco would be shipped off to Europe, uh, meaning that the, slave, the, the enslaved Africans would often be put into increasingly brutal work to meet the quotas uh, required to gain a profit <laughs> uh, by plantation owners. Another key factor uh, that we need to take a look at is, is uh, the rising population of Africans in early colonial South Carolina. So star from, in between the period of 1700 to 1740, the population of enslaved Africans increased exponentially with the population of enslaved Africans starting at between 2,440 to 4,100 uh, in the period of 1700 through to 1710, with only around 3,000 other enslaved Africans being imported during that 10-year time period, uh, which is a stark contrast to the population of enslaved Africans in the 10-year period from 1730 to 1740, uh, where at the beginning of this period, the population of enslaved Africans was around 20,000, and ending uh, in this period, the population of enslaved Africans was around 30,000, with a uh, total number of around 21,150 other enslaved Africans being imported during this period of time. And all of this would result in the population of enslaved Africans outnumbering the population of both white plantation owners and uh, lower class whites who weren't plantation owners in South Carolina by a significant margin. Uh, as you can see here, the population uh, of enslaved Africans by 1740 was around 40,000 you know, 30,000, 40,000, give or take, whereas the population of uh, whites, whether they be plantation owners or lower class white, uh, lower class Britishmen, uh, was only around 20,000. And then all of this would be further exacerbated by the existence of Spanish Florida. So Spanish Florida really became a thorn and, and the colonial British uh, institution of slavery uh, with the proclamation of um, by Charles II of Spain granting asylum to runaway enslaved Africans so long as they converted to Catholicism, uh, which of course required a baptism with Christian names, as well as uh, the promise that they would serve for four years in the Spanish colonial militia. And of course, this became very enticing to enslaved Africans in uh, southern colonies like South Carolina and North Carolina. And here's Spanish Florida here. Uh, and after making this decree, uh, Charles II and the Spanish Empire would build Fort Mose, a powerful, heavily fortified fort in Florida uh, for the um, asylum of these enslaved Africans so long as they garrisoned it as members of its militia, which, of course, many of them did. Another 
uh, arguably bigger factor, the arguably the biggest factor in uh, that led to the Stone Rebellion was during the year of 1739, a malaria epidemic dramatically decreased the population of white British people in South Carolina, specifically in Charleston. Uh, so because of all of these factors, the increased African enslaved population of enslaved Africans, the granting of asylum to runaway enslaved Africans in Spanish Florida, and the granting of their freedom and emancipation in Spanish Florida, as well as the dramatic decrease of white of the white population in South Carolina after the malaria ep epidemic, the South Carolina go uh, colonial government created the Security Act of 1739, which required all white males to carry arms even to church on Sundays. However, uh, it had not taken into full effect uh, by the time of the rebellion. Which brings me to the Stone Rebellion itself. So seeing the rising population of enslaved Africans and the declining population of white British colonists uh, due to the malaria epidemic, uh, an individual by the name of Jimmy or Jimmy would begin to gather enslaved Africans and plan a revolt against the white plantation owners, uh, eventually gathering around 79 individuals. Uh, with many of these individuals, including Jimmy himself, being former soldiers of the Kingdom of Congo, making them experienced and well-trained fighters in their own right, and well-experienced in conducting warfare against enemy opponents, against enemy nations. Uh, furthermore, many of these uh, enslaved Africans were Catholic as the Kingdom of Congo converted to Catholicism pretty quickly after meeting the Portuguese Empire. So this made the uh, existence of uh, Catholic Spain, of Catholic uh, Florida, as well as the existence of the proclamation of uh, granting asylum to enslaved Africans by the Spanish King Charles II uh, made Spanish Florida a very tempting, uh, alluring uh, place to escape. So with that in mind, Jimmy would and the rebels would plan uh, upon their assumed success in this rebellion would plan to flee to Spanish Florida. Uh, and they started their rebellion on Sunday, uh, which they had planned for because most colonists were at church and unarmed. Remember, yes, there was the Security Act of 1739, which uh, ordered all white men to have their weapons with them, their muskets or what have you with them, even at church at all times. But it had not fully gone into effect. So, so while that law existed, uh, most of the white colonists were still unarmed on uh, on Sunday at church, making it the prime time for these rebels to begin their attack. And of course, begin it they did. Uh, the rebels would quickly rise up and would very easily and quickly defeat dozens of colonists within this area you see here. Uh, and they would quickly gather as many weapons as they could, uh, as well as burning down multiple plantations, gaining quite a few early successes. Uh, with the weapons that they gathered being, um, for the most part, probably agricultural tools like size, uh, which were used in the harvesting of rice. But 
for anyone who has worked with a scythe knows they're still pretty formidable weapons, especially in the hands of somebody who's already an experienced fighter and soldier like many of the rebels were. And uh, so therefore, and because many of them were enslaved, were slaves on rice plantations, it, it's assumed that these were probably the weapons that the majority of the 79 rebels had. Though, it's also important to note that it's not a huge leap to assume that the rebels were able to get their hands on some uh, British brown best muskets, uh, as well as some British sabers. Uh, this is a typical British saber from the 1700s, uh, roughly the 1720s through the 1700s. Uh, 60s to 80s. But again, while they were probably able to get some, a hold of some of these, the main, the, the, the weapons that were prominent through, prominently used by most of the rebels were probably agricultural tools like sides. Which, of course, played a factor in their eventual defeat. Because while the rebels were able to gain a lot of early victories, and while the rebels were probably uh, probably had some comparable military training to the British colonists, to the British militia, they were not as well equipped. So eventually, the better equipped British militia would track down the rebels at a distal river and would defeat them. Uh, also, it's important to note the militia were outnumbered them. They were the militia estimates were around ninety nine to like one hundred and fifty, so they they outnumbered them uh, not by much but by enough, and combined with their better equipment, uh, which leads us to the aftermath. So it's important to bring up that while they were defeated at the Disto River, many of the rebels were able to escape. So as a result of their escape, the South Carolina government would enlist the Catawba and Chickasaw nations to help track down the survivors. Uh, and here is sort of a typical look of a uh, of the warriors of uh, fighters of the various tribal nations of the southeastern U.S. US during the colonial period. These are uh, Chickasaw, um, and these are, to be fair, Cherokee, but again, they would have looked very similar to each other. And this is sort of what the uh, Catawba and Chickasaw warriors who tracked down the uh, rebels would have sort of looked like. After defeating the rebels at Adisto River, and after the Catawba and Chickasaw rounded up the survivors of that battle, most of the rebels were either executed, uh, as was the case with Jimmy, or were sold to the sugar plantations in the West Indies, which um, were having had a reputation for even, for being even more brutal than the South Carolina colonies already were. To their enslaved Africans. And here are the uh, West Indies. Uh, they would probably be, probably be, probably been sent to, uh, say, Jamaica or maybe the Cayman Islands, uh, but they could have be, indeed even been sold to other places as well. And so, after all of that, as a result of this rebellion, uh, a very restrictive law would be put in place, known as the Negro Act of 1740, which made it illegal for enslaved Africans to move abroad, assemble in groups, raise food, earn money, and forbade, forbade them from learning to write, uh, though reading was not, uh, though reading was allowed. Additionally, owners were, uh, uh, from that point forward, uh, permitted to kill rebellious slaves if necessary, and of course, this act remained into effect even after uh, South Carolina became a part of the United States. But despite its uh, re uh, relative shortness, uh, the Stone Rebellion was, of course, the largest uh, rebellion by enslaved Africans in. North America in the territory that is now the United States, uh, and it would also, despite being a failure, have 
uh, in heavy influence on future conflicts. Uh, these would be, it would have heavy influence on uh, the Anglo-Cherokee War with one of the fears uh, and one of the factors that led to the Anglo-Cherokee War being that uh, Native American nations like the Cherokee generally saw uh, African Americans as equals uh, and would help uh, provide them asylum uh, if they ran away. Um, and so the South Carolina colonies began to fear that this that this uh, camaraderie that Native Americans saw with African Americans would lead to another large scale rebellion like the Stono Rebellion. Now, uh, as I as I mentioned in when I did a video covering the subject, uh, which I'll link in the i card, this was not the only factor. There were a variety of other factors, but it was still a major factor in on itself. Uh, the Stone Rebellion would also go on to influence the American Revolution, um, which saw a lot of uh, enslaved African Americans uh, and free African Americans too, uh, fighting on both the side of the British and on the side of the colonists, eventually the Americans, uh, in hopes of gaining freedom and emancipation from slavery. Uh, I will also link, I've already also already done a video on this and it will be linked in the iCard. Uh, it also had an influence on the War of 1812, which again saw very similar to the American Revolution, uh, free and enslaved African Americans fighting on both sides in the hopes of gaining uh, emancipation and equality from slavery. Again, I've already done a video on this, link will be in the iCard. Uh, and it especially had influence on the Second Seminole War, uh, with many of the enslaved Africans who were not recaptured by the Chickasaw and Catawba uh, fleeing to Florida and eventually intermarrying with the Native American tribes in Florida, leading to the creation of the Black Seminoles as a uh, ethnic entity um, of which would play a major factor in the Second Seminole War. Again, I've already done a video on this and link in the iCard. Uh, and of course, unsurprisingly, uh, the uh, this the Seminole Rebellion would have a major influence on the American Civil War with the fear of, quote, servile insurrection, uh, something which the Stone Rebellion was, uh, being a major factor in the eventual uh, secession of the, uh, of the southern states from the Union. Now, again, it would not be the only factor, but it would be a major factor um, that, of course, was linked to the main factor of the start of the Civil War, and that was the uh, proposed abolition or the proposed gradual ending of slavery. And I've already done a video on this, link in the R card as well. Uh, and of course, uh, the primary, the, the, the thread, the, the, 